Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Hello, and welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. Of course, I am your host, Chris Martinson. Today, we're speaking with Rob Hopkins, somebody I've spoken with before on the other end of the interview, interviewee cycle. And uh, Rob's a true pioneer of the movement in our adaption to a post-peak world. Rob leads a vibrant new movement of towns and communities, uh, cities that utilize local cooperation and interdependence to shrink their ecological footprints. He's developed the concept of transition initiatives with a couple of other uh, gentlemen, uh, communities that produce their own goods and services, curb the need for transportation, take other measures to prepare for a post-oil future. Now, while transition shares certain principles with greenness and sustainability, it's really, it's a deeper vision concerned with reimagining our future in a self-sufficient way that's built upon resiliency, a concept I am really familiar with and very much in support of. From his hometown in Totnes, UK, the original transition town uh, started there, he offers to help hundreds of similar communities that have sprung up around the world, in part through his blog, transitionculture.org. Uh, and through writings. So welcome, Rob. It's an honor to have you as our guest today and to speak with you again. Hi, Chris. Yeah, lovely to be talking to you again. Great. So uh, could you, for um, the people who may not have heard uh, about Transition Towns, can you elaborate on on the founding mission behind Transition Towns and what it is? Well, I guess it comes out of uh, many of the same motivations that um, are of interest to, to, to those who would be listening to your podcasts around uh, economic contraction around peak oil, uh, also around climate change, and these sort of putting all of these issues together. Uh, our analysis was that actually what we lack uh, enormously now is, as you say, resilience uh, at the local level, is that ability to withstand shock. And uh, Ian Dowie, who used to manage Crystal Palace Football Club uh, in London here in the UK, he used to describe resilience as bounce back ability. Uh, and in transition, we take that idea of bounce back ability, but sort of, but add on to it and say, actually, the process of making the places that we live more uh, bounce backable, if that's the word, uh-huh. uh, could actually be the making of those places. And that at the moment, when the, the flight of global capital from uh, communities such as such, such as this means that we don't have very much to fall back on. And originally it came out of a, an analysis around peak oil and the argument that you know when oil becomes very uh, very expensive, the price becomes very volatile, then the globalized way of doing everything becomes very, very fragile, very, very vulnerable. And so to put back uh, that, that kind of more localized economy, we argue, isn't something that you do just because it's kind of a nice thing to do. It, can, it will actually, within time, inevitably become the economic mainstay of the places where we live. So... We use this term of, of uh, uh, localization as economic development. So this isn't about sort of localization as an idea that, that just hangs around on pin boards in whole food shops. This is around localization being the idea that, uh, that underpins how we start as local economies to think about our future. So meeting more of our, our, our own needs in terms of food, closing those cycles, uh, community-owned energy companies, uh, setting up the, the infrastructure that we're going to need, but in such a way that it benefits our, our communities rather than all the money just pouring out through the, through the holes. So it's very much about looking forward. It's very much about progress. It's very much about framing that in the context of the, of, of the scenario that we're moving into, not sticking our heads in the sand, not running around uh, panic, panic with a panic look in our eyes, but um, looking at this as a, as, as a one-off a tremendous historic opportunity to rethink some basic assumptions. And, and of the things that need rethinking, I guess something that, that was sort of an act of faith on a lot of communities' part was that um, we all do whatever we do. We do our jobs, and uh, we spend our money, and, and somehow it all balances out. But if you back up just a couple steps, if you're a family, you know that if you spend more than you earn, you are slowly getting poor. Uh, similarly, I guess the analogy here is for a community, if, if you are importing more than you're exporting, whether that's liquid fuels or food or clothing or whatever those things happen to be, if that balance of trade is not in your favor, you are slowly eroding. And I guess as we look across this landscape, 
where things have now complexity's caught up with us. It's a very complex environment to to live in. And I my view is that the communities that that can grasp that, see the opportunity in that, can say, how do we maintain control of the things we can? Um, in some cases, that might be as you know, if you don't have energy, if you can use less of it, that's the equivalent of importing less. So um, that starts to work in your favor. So this is really about knowing what our sources of wealth are, understanding them, understanding where we're hemorrhaging wealth, controlling that to the best we can, and that as we cast forward, I guess the idea would be. Some communities are going to fare better than others in large measure how they approach this part of that story. Is that what you mean by economic development? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity here for places that, are, that get ahead of the curve. You know, if when you look at this through the eyes of peak oil as a challenge, then the, uh, the, the contraction of the energy that underpins uh, globalization is inevitably going to contract. And so uh, the distances over which we're able to do things is going to get shorter. But actually, to put in place the infrastructure you need in order to have a, a different approach, a more resilient approach, that doesn't happen overnight. You know, we're talking a, a, a longer kind of process. So, uh, so the, the, the sooner places get underway and get started with it, the better, I think. I mean, in the UK, every year, we export the same amount, about one and a half million kilos of potatoes to Germany as we import from Germany. Hmm which really benefits nobody apart from, I mean, if somebody gave me an English potato and a German potato, I think I'd be pushed to tell the difference, really. Uh, uh, and all it really benefits is, is petrol companies and road-making companies and creating work for lorry drivers. Um, and actually, the, the process of closing the loop and, and uh, uh, consuming more of the produce locally and recreating those markets isn't just good from the, from the perspective of using less fossil fuel, creating less carbon emissions. It's also really good in terms of, uh, you know, our being more connected to the place around us, to feeling part of an agricultural community, eating fresher food that's in season, all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, so, so sometimes things are presented, things that we need to do are presented as being some, some, some kind of a retreat. Uh, but I think, you know, when we talk about resilience, we're not just talking about Community resilience, we're talking about personal resilience, uh, ecological resilience, all of those things go hand in hand if we get it right. I mean, it's important as well to say that the concept of resilience is something that uh, doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily a good thing. You know, you could imagine a resilient community that uh, that isn't so good in terms of social justice and community ownership and that side of things. So it's really important that from day one we get those things right and that the models we put in place are based on good models that are going to be sustainable in the longer term. And and how, how would you define sustainable in the longer term? Well, in such a way that they aren't going to be uh, hemorrhaging money from, from the place, that they aren't going to be perpetuating and, and deepening social inequality, rather they're going to be about bringing that community together. So if, for example, you design a local food system which is all based around some kind of feudal approach where it's all owned by one family and everybody else kind of works for that family. We may be getting organic potatoes, but we're not necessarily building uh, the kind of social cohesion and, and more equity that actually we're going to need in order for that to be sustainable. Right. So, so we're, if, if we default into letting circumstances prescribe that to us, we might be back to the future, as it were, back to a feudal state last seen in the 1800s or something. Um, yeah, well, people who write about the idea of localization, you know, they talk about, the, I mean, what academics call it, reflexive and unreflexive localiz localization, mm. which you could just to mean, you know, a really good, healthy form and a really dreadful form. And we can look back through history uh, at some pretty dire versions of localization, uh, which may have been more resilient than, than they were today, but they were oppressive and patriarchal, hierarchical, and so on and so on. Uh, so I think at this stage now, when we're starting the process of laying out what we want to be moving towards, it's really important that we that we do that and set those foundations in place uh, properly at this stage, I think. And so your view then is that sufficient resources and willpower and energy exist at this stage to, to make that transition smoothly or relatively smoothly? Where do you stand on that? Um, I don't know for sure. I don't think anybody knows for sure. Um, uh, but I, my hope is, yes, that there, that there would be the resources to do that, but, um, but we need to be skillful about it. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that, that, that some transition groups do is what we call an energy descent action plan, or because transition originally has its roots in, in permaculture, which is a design system, 
you know, we argue there needs to be an element of, actual, of, of planning what we're going to do, uh, of collectively coming together, thinking about what we want to do, and then actually moving towards it. This isn't something that will come around by accident. And I think that's one of the things that, that distinguishes transition from previous uh, kind of environmental community processes, in that it does, it, it, it's very ambitious. And it starts out with those kind of smaller things that we're all familiar with local green groups doing, like growing vegetables and digging up lawns and swapping this, that, and the others. But it's very ambitious in terms of where it's going. And in the book that I've just finished, which will be coming out in October, The Transition Companion, that's one of the things that really distinguishes it, that it starts out with those smaller projects, but it says this is a collective design process, that you need to be thinking about this process of in intentional localization uh, and then starting to move towards it so that the aim is that you're setting, creating your own banks, your own energy companies, your own food systems that are based from the outset on those, uh, on, on those good principles. So then this uh, transition companion, uh, I guess, uh, it improves the state of the art. Some learnings have been wrapped into that over, over what's happened since, since the, uh, the original transition book. Uh, what, what else can you tell us? What, what's new in this book, and, and uh, what, what can we look forward to in there? Well, it's entirely new. It's an entirely new book. And basically the transition handbook, which came out in 2008, said, what would it look like if there was something a bit like this that did something like this? And it was very early on in the whole process. There were mm -hmm. maybe 20 or 30 transition initiatives when it was written, and there were some projects underway. But it was kind of a speculative vision of, of, of what uh, the kind of movement that felt most appropriate at the time would look like. So over the time that's gone on since, we've gone from that 20 initiatives up to many hundreds of them in 35 countries now around the world. Mm -hmm. And I often think of transition as being like uh, a a huge social experiment in that we had, we, we had a very simple model, a very simple set of tools, principles that have gone out all around the world. And people have tried them out, experimented with them in settings as diverse as favelas in Sao Paulo, uh, cities in the US, villages in, in, in England, all different parts of London, and so on and so on. And what I've tried to do in this book is to pull back what seem to be the learnings from that, what's what's been people's experience what's working what's not working where do we find ourselves what are the stories people are telling about their successes about their failures uh it's a very uh it's a very honest book a very straightforward book uh, uh and it pulls together transition as a different model so it's really about the idea of transition not being something that there's a prescriptive model mm -hmm. you start with this and then you do this and then you must do this before you think about doing this it's more thinking about it as being like a, a series of ingredients, a collection of ingredients that people assemble in their own way. So it's like making a cake. You know, everybody will make a cake in a different way. There are certain steps that you have to do. You can't just chuck the butter and the flour in a bowl and put it straight in the oven and hope for a cake. You have to go through certain stages, but within that, you very much are free to arrange things how you like. So it draws together these ingredients, these tools, which are things that we've seen where a transition group has come up with a problem or a challenge and has come up with a solution that we've seen uh, uh, replicated enough times to have some kind of faith it's going to work. So I think it's very, very rich in stories, in photos from around the world, in their posters, their artwork, their stories, their ex experiences, and pulling all of that together into something that's very, very flexible, uh, but very effective. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a very deeply collaborative process creating it as well, you know, putting up drafts and getting people to comment on them. Uh, and I'm really thrilled with it, yeah. I think that's that's a fabulous approach because, you know, this uh, we're in a very complex environment and it's going to shift in very complex ways, I'm going to say unpredictable ways. Local mileage will vary. Um, there are local different sources of wealth and assets and liabilities, all of which need to be accounted for. So the idea that there's a perfect recipe, um, which everybody wants, but it really seems not not to be something we should really be seeking at this stage. Rather, there's this idea that um, this is going to be an incredible period of discovery and creativity and uh, inquiry into into how things are shifting. Um, so it's it's fabulous that you're collecting that. What what is what if if we could go to both sides of that that tail set? You know what's been working and what hasn't been working so far. 
Um, I think the things that have been working have been, uh, there are some very exciting projects starting to emerge in terms of community energy companies. Mm -hmm. um, there's some fantastic uh, community engagement stuff that people have been doing. There's some um, just there's some really beautiful stories of projects of just people identifying a problem and applying that sort of creative transition thinking, which is playful and fun, and coming up with some really good solutions. So I've certainly that that process of of gathering in stories has been really really heartening. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the degree to which uh, I started out the book thinking, okay, so where, where's transition going now? Where, where does it feel appropriate to me that, that, that this book argues that it should move? And one of those things was around enterprise, was around not waiting for government or, or large uh, corporations to start putting in place the, the, the business models that, that we need now. It's, it's really down to us to get on with it and to make it viable and to stop moaning around the fact that actually nobody's doing anything when actually we could be doing stuff if we were able to step our game up and, and get the right people together and, uh, and start putting these things in place. Um, so, uh, but what was really interesting then was going out and looking around at what transition groups were doing and finding there were actually loads of those things emerging already. You know, what, what they call social enterprise, businesses that are set up with a larger uh, remit rather than just making profit for the owner but of actually having a wider social benefit to the, to, to the community around it. And finding all sorts of things from, from uh, vegetable box distribution schemes, local food growing schemes, uh, very, very uh, ambitious community energy organizations, uh, community shops, community pubs, community breweries, these kind of things. Uh, uh, they weren't my idea, they were already out there, you know, so it was really exciting to see that. I think some of the things that maybe don't work so well, I think the, the thing that came through time and again was the importance of uh, uh, setting groups up properly from the beginning. That actually sometimes we all come together with this great enthusiasm and inspired by work such as yours or mm -hmm. the seeing the end of suburbia or, or wherever that wherever that momentum comes from of mm -hmm. thinking, my God, we need to do something here. But then we're so driven and so compelled and so enthused that actually we just, you know, think all that stuff about getting a group set up properly so that everybody knows what everyone's doing, that you know how you're going to communicate properly. All that stuff you think, oh, we're in too much of a rush for that. We'll do that later. We're just going to do stuff. And actually the, 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 the initiatives who we've seen who've had difficulties have been the ones where they haven't got those group processes in place. And then there's all, you know, disagreements and then those groups fall apart. I mean, a very, very small percentage actually, but that's one of the key learnings really has been the importance of getting all that group stuff done from the beginning. Right. So it, it's, um, it's clear some people, when they first look into this landscape, uh, and this happened to me, there's, it's easy to come away with a fair degree of urgency. So I, I imagine somebody who's sitting in Europe today and is looking at the relative levels of paralysis and, and attempts to fix the economic system and things aren't working could look into that um, situation with some degree of alarm and, and conclude that perhaps change was coming quickly. It, what, how, does, how does one balance that tension uh, between the desire to act and, and the desire to set things up properly? How, how does one navigate that space? Well, what what we argue in the in, in in the transition companion is that is that there are very simple uh, tools and approaches which can be woven into the first few meetings of, of 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 a group like that, which just mean that from then on everybody knows where they're at and everybody knows what's happening and the whole thing moves forward um, much much more smoothly and with much less risk of of, of difficulty uh, and you know des designing in. Uh, a commitment to to good communication, that sort of stuff, uh, makes a big, big difference. And we've seen that time and again. You know, those, those projects that are really, really thriving are, what are the ones that just gave that stuff a little bit of space at the beginning to allow it to really bed in. Uh, and now they're off doing really quite extraordinary, extraordinary things because, you know, that that sense of that sense of urgency that drives people 
to think about this. Uh, you know, you only, it sounds a bit over dramatic, so you only get one chance of doing this. But actually, if, if, you, if a transition group comes together and then they all fall out with each other, then it takes a while for maybe other people to come in and say, well, let's pick that, this up and keep it moving forward. So it's, it's really good to, just to get it going from the start because it's really extraordinary when you see what those groups can do when they've, when they've got the right, the right foundations in place. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So, um, well, it, speaking on, on, on this a little bit, where do you see us on the peak oil timeline now versus when you first started? Well, when we first started, nobody knew at all what we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, peak oil was something that rarely made it into the media. Uh, it was it was a fairly obscure sort of backwater, I guess. And it was it was only because you know through through meeting Colin Campbell and and spending time with Colin Campbell that you actually uh, were able to get some really rich kind of information about it at that stage and somebody who who was very compelling in terms of arguing that you know now f- five six years later it's it's pretty much a mainstream kind of recognition I think it's moved very very quickly uh, and r- remarkable uh, how that's happened I think. I think obviously the, uh, the, the 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 economic unraveling that has uh, that has begun is uh, is means that we're in a very very different kind of a landscape. Uh, I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, because transition is underpinned by those three things: peak oil and climate change and the whole economic um, issues. Uh, that actually each of those issues kind of pulse at different times. And I think, you know, in, in, in peak oil, uh, from I mean, Colin, used, when I first met him, he was talking about that idea of the bumpy plateau. Mm-hmm. You know, that it's not you just go up to a neat little peak and then sort of start plummeting away down the other side. You bump along the top for a while, which you're going up and down and up and down. But actually, on the downward sides of those, which is what we're on now, uh, um, people really stop caring about environmental things. Because the pressure on the on the money in their pocket becomes so intense, uh, climate change, peak oil, these things aren't such an issue. But then, as soon as you get back into anything resembling economic growth or any kind of an activity, those issues become very much come come very much more to the fore. So, I think we're an interesting sort of pulsing backwards and forwards between being interested in those issues and being absolutely in a blind panic about the financial things. We're very much, I find, it, at a local level. Uh, uh, focused on where is the economic activity going to come from. And when I look around at the, our local council here, our local business organizations, they're still focused on this idea that uh, when we get back to growth in two or three years, uh, we're going to do this, that, and the other. We're going to do all this building. We're going to do all this, that, and the other. And whenever I give talks, I always start out by saying, okay, f- for the next hour, we're not going to use the term when we get back to growth. Okay, we're going to park that at the door, and we're going to have a space in this in this room where we can uh, talk uh, as though that's not the case. Because actually, for people who work in local government, business, and so on, they don't really get to sit in that space very often. Uh, but that's really really important. So, uh, for me, I I mean, I'm not I'm not a peak oil expert. I'm not an econ- economic expert. I'm I'm, I'm sufficiently convinced that those two things are, are enormously compelling, pressive, pressing challenges that aren't going anywhere other than becoming more pressing challenges. So my focus is really, what do we do? What do we do on the ground about it? Uh, but that's my observation is that we, we tend to sort of waver between uh, thinking maybe it'll all get all right again so we can worry about peak oil and climate change uh, or being really despondent about the fact that it's all going down the tubes, in which case we, we forget those issues. But what's beautiful about the concept of resilience is that it draws in all those things. Mm. That it's not a, it's about being resilient to climate change, it's about being resilient to peak oil, resilient to peak oil. It's about being resilient economically, and that's a kind of a steady uh, stream that you can ride through all of those things. It's a common language uh, and a common focus that whether people are worrying about peak oil or whether they're worrying about the the, the, the coins in their pocket uh, is still something very steady and very constant. Yeah, and those things probably, to some degree, will always be with us. Economic concerns have been in people's minds since the dawn of time, practically. 
um, when we came under the current system we're on. And that's really the framework I bring to this is the idea that the system we have is just fundamentally changing. And, and let me be more specific. It cannot continue in the way and in the manner it had been going. Um, and that's really hard to, to get to. It's a very emotional subject. It, it touches on beliefs for a lot of people like faith in technology or belief in human spirit or, you know, our creativity or you have to be optimistic, whatever the belief structures happen to be. Um, and, and this is the interesting period of time I find us in is that now there is more and more and more compelling evidence, whichever one of those spheres that you mentioned you want to look at, whether it's in the environmental sphere or whether it happens to be in the economic sphere or you want to look in the energy sphere, it doesn't matter, or all three. But you can peek in there and say, wow, there are, there's enough evidence here to suggest that um, uh, the prudent thing to do would be to prepare as if we're not going back to normal. Um, we're not going back to growth, that uh, the ways in which we've become accustomed to things working is now shifting right before our very eyes. Um, certainly anybody who's in the economics here, the debt markets do not work like they used to. And we've got about three years of proof of that, and we'll probably have a few more in front of us. And, and my theory is that we're not ever going to see those return to what people knew for the past 20, 30, 40 years. So here we are, and, and the question then becomes, what are the sorts of things we do and we can do? And your approach has been to take it at the community level, um, community being as large as cities, I suppose, um, but, but at that level rather than the, the state level, as it were, or, or even uh, the global level. Um, why is it that you, you started uh, there? Um, because, well, firstly to say that, that we don't for a moment say that the, the local and the community level is the only... Uh, level where any meaningful change can be affected. Obviously, we need national government, we need local government, we need business, we need all these things all pulling together. But I guess, for me, it feels like the local will be the scale that will be the most viable. You know, James mm -hmm. Kunstler says, you know, the future will be in, uh, inherently, uh, intensely and inherently local or something like that. And David Fleming, who was a, a, a brilliant... Um, economist here who died last year so used to say that localization stands at best at the limits of practical possibility, but it has the decisive argument in its favor that there will be no alternative. Hmm. So we, we very much took that as the focus because it felt like it was, the, it was the part that was being neglected. It's the part that people are passionate about and that they care about. And, you know, when you were saying there about debt and everything, I mean, my sense is, is that people will get this at different points. And if we imagine that everybody needs to get this before we can actually do anything meaningful, we're not going to do anything meaningful in time. The, the idea with transition is really that if we can get things in place which just make sense, which don't ram peak oil and climate change and economic models down people's throats, but which become the things that are creating work for people, they become the things that people are proudest of because they are... Uh, celebratory of the place and of mm -hmm. the culture and, and so on. Uh, and I start to see that here in Totnes, in Devon, where I'm speaking to you from today, which is the first transition town uh, in the UK. And uh, what we've seen, I think originally when we started doing transition, I imagined it was a, an environmental process. But increasingly, I think of it as a cultural process. Mm -hmm. in that it starts to become the story that the town tells mm -hmm. about itself. Well, now when it starts to talk about its future, it talks about transition. People come to visit the place because of transition and it increasingly becomes a thing that, that, that people are proud about and the story that it starts to tell about itself. You know, there are now some businesses that are emerging here that are, it's early days, but there are businesses emerging here which are very much rooted in that and lots more in the pipeline. Models like uh, the Totnes Renewable Energy Society, which allows local people to invest in what will be too uh, two large wind turbines on the edge of Totnes, uh, which will be owned by the community for the benefit of the community. These kind of things don't say that you have to believe in peak oil or climate change or the end of growth in order to be a part of it. They bring people on board because they're a celebration of the place. They feel fantastic. Uh, you'd rather have your money in a local energy company that you know the people who run it, you're excited about its progress, you know other people who are part of it, rather than just having them off in some distant shares in something that you have no, no control over. So I think we, we, we have only just really started to scratch the surface in terms of the, the potential uh, power of this, I think. 
that localization as economic development is a really powerful idea. And, uh, you know, in climate change, there's this very famous climate wedges model that says, well, at the moment we're rising like this. What we need to be doing is going down like this. Uh, and uh, so that will be made up of a number of wedges, sort of electronic, electric cars and so on and so on. I think that actually one of the big, big wedges of those could be intentional localization if we can get it right. Uh, and I think once we've kind of proved that concept in a few places, uh, it will really start to motor and really start to accelerate very sharply. You know, we have, so here in Lewis, in Sussex, Transition Town Lewis recently uh, set up uh, the, a local energy company. That energy company just launched the UK's first uh, community-owned solar power station. They raised £300,000 from local people to put the panels on the roof of a local brewery, and that brewery brewed a special beer called Sunshine Ale to celebrate the mm-hmm. launch. Now, these kind of things aren't about people taking people back to something worse than, than today. They're a step forward. They're about building resilience, build, bringing people together, giving them a sense of anything is possible uh, in such a way that everybody benefits. Fantastic. Um, uh, it's... Uh the the part about the narrative is it really caught me because it's uh you know stories shape our own lives uh, national or cultural stories shape destinies and really I think we have an old story running which may not be serving us any longer a story of growth um, has been has been the one I focus on and and because we have that story we we act in certain ways you cannot possibly open the newspaper without hearing about a political or uh, monetary leader talking about the necessity of returning to growth. It's just axiomatic. We don't even discuss why that's true. We just have to get back to growth, growth in jobs, growth in the economy, growth in something. And and obviously, uh, if you just step back just even uh, uh, one full step from that story, you understand that can't be true forever, um, that there is at some point uh, an end to that story. And and I think we're, we're there. And that that's really the, the deep dis-ease that's being felt across the landscape by a lot of people, be they financially, uh, um, ecologically, or uh, energy-focused, they know that there's something shifting in the story. But it's, I find, almost impossible to shift away from a story without being able to shift towards a different story. And so I'm hearing in in your your description that transition is offering a a version, um, and, and people are seeing that and responding to it. And it really doesn't matter what lens they're peering through. In fact, they don't even have to have any lens. Uh, you're saying that if, if done correctly, people don't necessarily even have to believe in or look at or understand anything about those three sort of views or, or any other views uh, that they can participate. Is, is that what you're finding? Yeah, I think it's it's like you know, Richard Heinberger once said about transition that it feels more like a party than a protest march. Hmm. And I think you know when you were saying about moving away from one story and towards another, there's two ways you can do that. You can either sort of try and belittle and shame and terrify everybody that they have to move away from this story. This story is finished. There's no future in this story. You're rubbish if you still believe in this story. Or you create the other story that we want people to move to in such a way that it's just so enticing. And it's such a more nourishing, more enriching, more celebratory place to be that you don't need to belittle the the first one. Uh, and I had a real re- reminder of this the other day, actually, and, 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 and the power of, of, of story in that uh, about three years ago here in Totnes, inspired by some examples of uh, printed local currencies from, from mainland Europe uh, and from the U.S., particularly the Berkshires um, currency in, in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. uh, I got together with a couple of people here in Totnes quite early on in the life of TTT and said... Um, what would it look like? Oh, yeah, that was it, because I went into a, into an office here, and they had on the wall framed a banknote from 1810 that was issued by the Totnes Bank, mm-hmm. a Totnes one-pound note. And I said, what would it, well, what would it be like if we issued, uh, if we reissued it, if we, if we issued a, a Totnes pound now? How would that work? And we talked about it, and then someone said, well, don't you have to have permission from somewhere to do something like that? Mm-hmm. And we asked a few people, and nobody seemed to know. So we thought, well, let's just have a go and uh, and print them and see. So we printed just 300 uh, Totnes pounds, and 18 shops said they would take them. And we just ran it as an, a pilot for about three months just to see if people liked it and what happened and so on. Uh, people did like it. The shops really liked it. So that scheme has then grown 
uh, into uh, we've had two different issues of, of notes now. Uh, it inspired other places, Brixton, Lewis, Stroud, uh, Hoyk in Scotland, a few other places to then do printed currencies. Uh, and then that has now inspired the city of Bristol, uh, which is a large city in the southwest of England, uh, to launch the Bristol Pound, which will be a mixture of a printed currency and a really, really innovative um, uh, electronic currency, which is based on people's mobile phones. The local mm. council are behind it. They're very, very supportive. They're putting money into it. They're going to say that you know people will be able to pay their their, their taxes mm. using Bristol Pound. Nice. Um, and actually, that's all kind of grown just from that thing of saying, what would it be like? But doing it in such a way that it's a really interesting story. So that story of Totnes prints its own money had such a sort of a, a power to it and a resonance for so many people. But obviously, when we started doing that, we didn't think, oh, yes, well, uh, a part of our cunning master plan for world domination mm-hmm. is that in four years' time, the city of Bristol will do one based on currencies. But these ideas create a push uh, and, they, and, and they draw people. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that I've learned increasingly. You know, you were asking what, what have been the learnings from, from four or five years of doing transition. I think one of them is that you have no idea where these things are going to go. Once you start these things off, once you kick these things off, if you do them with, you do them with a good intention and, and get them out there, uh, there's, there, there's such a power to that, much, much more than we might actually be aware of at the time. All right. And trust and follow. Just just trust that, that uh, good intention of creativity. Creativity spawns much. Um, so many good things can come from it. I, I'm Just to yeah. follow up on that story of the money, so you didn't ask permission. Have you had to ask for forgiveness, or did nobody come knocking? Nobody came knocking, no. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> no, nobody came knocking. And, in fact, we formed, a, we formed an advisory panel of some of the sort of great and the good alternative economists, you know, Richard Douthwaite and hmm. Bernard Leotard and people. And we'd say to them, are we allowed to just print money and call them Tottenham's Pounds? And they said, we've got no idea. Try it and see. <laughs> I thought, what kind of an advisory panel is that? You know? uh, but actually, I, I think the legal status is kind of a bit like book tokens or those kind of vouchers. Sure. Yeah. Um, but but I th- it's it's that thing of um, I think there's a Woody Allen film. I can't remember which one it is. Where where he sat in a tree. It starts with him sat in a railway carriage, uh, and it's all black and white, and he's surrounded by the most miserable, long faced, depressed looking people uh, he could get together for, to make the film. And then he looks across into the carriage and next to him in the station, and everybody's having this, they're having this fantastic party and all drinking champagne, and everyone's gorgeous. And this woman blows him a kiss through the window, and then he looks back at this carriage who's sat in with all these brilliant kind of Woody Allen. But actually, I think that we should be trying to make transition feel like the like the carriage on the other side of the platform that you just that you just really really want to be in because that's where the that's where the party's happening. Fantastic, I, I like that view a lot. Um, so uh, w- here we are. Um, the world is is in my view um, in that bumpy plateau of uh, you know this peak oil era. And um, what's your view? So, so how does this all, so you put your forecast hat on, you look in and, and you see where we are on this bumpy plateau, best guess. And uh, the question here is, you know, will we have that critical mass of transition towns or new narratives or whatever, whatever we need? Um, and to really you know, sort of have a, a relatively smooth transition, are we going to find ourselves with some f- well-prepared communities and some um, at varying levels of vulnerability? How, how do you see this playing out? It was really fascinating this year. We had the Transition Network Conference, which we do once a year. And um, uh, one of the things that I had always wondered about transition, because as I, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is an experiment, uh, was when you get to a time when things get really difficult you know when the when the um when when the chips are down and things are clearly clearly very 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 tricky uh is wh- how does transition inform the response and there's that very famous quote by milton friedman about in times of real change it's the ideas that are on the table that, that are the ones that are that are picked up and examined you know, might that be the case for transition? And so we had people there from from various parts of the world. We had some people there from Brazil, where transition has just been on fire for the last eighteen months. Uh, all across Brazil, in in the, in the very poor areas, the favelas in São Paulo, uh, the more wealthy, more middle class uh, parts of parts of Brazil. 
and they had terrible floods there about 10 months ago and there was one town that was largely just washed down the hill there was transition training going on nearby and they said anybody who's from this community can come and do the training for free quite a few people came and did that and now transition is one of the key elements that's feeding into how that community is redesigning itself uh, in New Zealand, there were uh, parts of New Zealand where there were earthquakes recently, where they've had transition groups very active there for the last three years, putting in place time banks and this kind of thing. And when things were really, really difficult, quite a lot of people got in touch and said, you know, we're so grateful for having those initiatives in place. And what they've done uh, has been uh, has been really, uh, really an integral part of, of that response. Uh, and so, and in Japan as well, you know, where they had all kinds of dreadful mm-hmm. difficulties there over the last year or so. Again, the transition groups have been very much a part of that. So it's that question about does transition get into the drinking water? Does it get into the DNA so that when things get difficult, that's one of the key tools that gets picked up? And as I said before, with the, with the pound story, you know, once you start things, you have no idea where they go. Uh, and so it, that that was really fascinating insight for me. That was actually in those three places where things were really tricky, that was that was what had been picked up. Uh, wh- and and also, you know, the idea of whether whether we'll get enough people on board and enthused. I think sometimes there's this obsession with you have to get the kind of uh, unconverted on board. Uh, I think that is the case in, in that it's a good thing to aspire to, but. What's as important, or more important even, is that the people who are on board, the people who are already willing to put their shoulders to this, have the right tools in order to be able to, uh, in order to be able to, to get moving. And in Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, he says, you know, it's somewhere between 15 and 17 percent of people in the community constitutes the tipping point, uh, which is why I think we know we are seeing some places that have had transition going on for a while, really starting to, really starting to get moving and get motoring. Um, but those tipping points, you never know when those tipping points come, mm. when all of a sudden the idea that actually you shift your focus to investing more locally and building these kind of institutions just becomes completely accepted as mainstream. Well, it's blindingly obvious, isn't it? Mm. So to paraphrase Churchill, I believe uh, he was the one who said that in a time of crisis, the solutions that get adopted are the ones that happen to be lying around. Um, so if we get into this crisis period, like you mentioned with, with the floods in Brazil or, or other crises, however they happen to come about, the fact that there's a template nearby uh, in another community or, or perhaps in that same community that can be then used um, is just, a, a, well, that's a natural thing. That's how humans tend to operate anyway. Um, so so good for us for having some some templates of how to how to organize, how to work, how to be effective, how to, how to uh, take matters into our own hands. Um, with that being one of the surprising sort of um, determinants of success here. Yeah, because it's not about waiting for permission. Mm-hmm. You know, no one's going to kind of commission us to uh, design what a, a, um, a more localized, more resilient economy is going to be like. You know, it's really about just getting on with it and doing it with creativity and, and, and a good motivation in that way. Uh, and actually, I think it is really fascinating uh, observing in places the, the, the degree of pride there is about the about the transition group that's underway and the projects they've got going on. And you know, here that I mean, we did a big project here called Transition Streets, which was about working uh, to try and support behaviour change, but on a street by street level. So it wasn't about saying the council needs to come in and give everybody grants or whatever. It was about get out on your street, get a group of six to ten households together. Here's a simple thing to do where you meet seven times one week, you look at energy, then you look at water, so on and so on, look at food, and you reduce your emissions, you reduce your your, your consumption. Um, and on average, each household cut its carbon emissions by about one and a half tonnes. Uh, saved itself seven or eight hundred pounds a year but actually when you would meet people in the street who had done it and i met a lot of people here walking around uh just after 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 having done it they didn't talk to me about how much carbon they'd saved they didn't talk to me about how much less oil they used or how or how or about the global economy what they talked about was how they met they now knew dave over the road who was teaching them such and such how them and Sandra down at number seven were now working on that waste piece of ground at the end of the road and turning it into something else. It was that social cohesion that people were really, really craving. So if we can design this process in such a way that it brings people together in that kind of celebratory way, all the things that kind of spin off of that uh, 
build people's commitment to this kind of process. But that can't be done from the top down. That's a process that has to happen uh, from the ground up. Mm. So I, I know I know there's somebody listening to this right now who's, who feels like they're sitting in a glum boxcar and they're looking through a window uh, of this podcast and saying, wait, wait a minute, there's a party happening over there. Um, how do people find out about um, their local transition initiatives if there happens to be one or go about starting one? How, how does somebody become engaged with this who's listening right now? Well, there's some very good there's some very good resources online. If you're if you're listening in the U.S., transitionus.org has a very good um, way of finding out where all the initiatives are. Some very good tools for getting started. Um, in a month or so, they will be able to get a hands on the transition companion that'll be able to tell you that stuff. But if you're not in in, in the U.S., then transitionnetwork.org has a has a map of the world with all the initiatives and a transition near you button where you can find out where what's happening who are the people what are the projects what are the initiatives uh, that are happening around where you live um, if there's a group then go along and, and and get involved and bring what you're passionate about to it it's it's transition is really a process of of, of uh, you know if you if you're really passionate about food then uh, transition doesn't require you to go and sit through lots of boring meetings about energy uh, or whatever. It's about what you're passionate about. You bring that to this process uh, and you make that happen. So um, so there's lots of resources out there. You can go on YouTube and type in Transition Towns and there's a whole range of different things on there. Uh, there's a film we made called In Transition 1.0 and version 2.0 is coming out at the end of the year. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's all kinds of materials online which pull together those stories there's the transition us does a newsletter transition network does a monthly newsletter of, of what's going on so there's plenty out there uh um yeah jump in the water's the water's lovely <laughs> fantastic well i would really want to thank you for your time today and for the enthusiasm and most of all um for bringing your creativity and vision to the world and uh and then um sitting back and, and watching it run and, and um, collecting the stories. I think that's just a fabulous model, and it's uh, obviously been very successful. So all the best and uh, wonderful talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And, and, and uh, yeah, thank you for your work also. All right. You're welcome, and, and thanks for that. Bye. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C H R I S M A R T E N S O N dot com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action.